guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. This is the audio commentary for the movie Jaws, 1975. The movie that arguably uh, kicked off the modern blockbuster. And joining me for this audio commentary is Michael McCormick, a composer, co-producer of the documentary The Shark is Still Working, uh, which you can find on the Jaws DVD and Blu-ray. Michael, thank you so much for joining me for this. Oh, thanks for having me. It should be a lot of fun. So when it comes to Jaws, I can think of nobody uh, who has more knowledge about the subject uh, than you. You have lived in the, I was going to say in the trenches, you've lived in the depths of the Jaws um, orbit. That's not the right word, but you know what I'm saying? Like you, uh, you know, this stuff you have, uh, you've spent some time on. Uh... Yeah. Me and uh, some, some friends that uh, were Jaws fans all worked together for about seven years on getting the shark is still working out. Uh, which uh, you can get on the uh, Jaws Blu-ray that came out in 2012. And uh, so, yeah, we lived with Jaws for quite a while. And then before that, you know, as a kid, I just always pop this movie on. And uh, I, I don't want to say I'm an expert. There are a lot of experts. There's a lot of great fans out there that know quite a bit more than I do. But uh, And there's so many documentaries and so much information available about Jaws. But uh, it'll certainly be fun, and hopefully this will be fun to listen to. Uh, for anyone out there that uh, loves this movie like uh, we do. Absolutely. So I should also mention that you are uh, one half of the the band Hardware to Halo. Um, I've covered you guys' music on Serial at Midnight. There's a review at SerialAtMidnight.com. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, some of your music's even been in a couple of the videos, um, uh, some of the Serial at Midnight videos. So it is, it's just a pleasure to have you here. So well, It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you letting me be a part of the channel. I've, I've been watching been watching you since you, you first started you started with uh, you were, man you were there for count chocula's revenge <laughs> yeah i saw that and i had to see what was going on you saw that and you hit subscribe <laughs> <laughs> yeah man you've been around for since since the beginning and, I, and congratulations we're, we're uh congratulations on hitting ten thousand uh, subscribers that's that's incredible oh and thank it's you well man. deserved thank you so much i appreciate it all right so you're watching the dvd i'm watching the blu-ray right so uh we will count through by the way if you guys are watching secure your copy of jaws and it, we are going to sync with the film so if you want to watch this with the movie it will be synced up i know sometimes i get questions like should i watch this with the movie yeah absolutely if you if you want to um it's synced up for it so so i think we're going to start this at the very beginning of the universal logo right yeah so i was going to say if you pop in the on on both of these dvds and the blu-rays uh the there's a couple of there's like a federal warning at the beginning but we're gonna start past that it's at the actual universal logo past all the the federal warnings and stuff like that so we're gonna do like a three two one play and then we'll hit play and we will be off at the races ready michael i'm ready all right three two one play all right i'm looking at the the star now I'm looking at a spinning globe. You know, one interesting thing, you'll you'll hear some uh, some waves and you'll hear a little chirping on top of those waves as this logo plays out. And it's actually the birds. If you go to Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds at the beginning of that movie, those same birds you'll hear there as you will at the beginning of Jaws. Oh, man, that's amazing. That's really cool. I had no idea. Yeah, it's kind I mean, of, I actually kind of... double I actually double check that. And uh, put my birds in earlier, and there it was. It's like, oh, well, I gotta have, I gotta let them know about that. There's so much stuff around this movie that, um, like, I, when you know you're gonna do an audio commentary, you try to dig into the trivia and stuff like that. The trivia for this movie runs so deep. Right. There's um, there's there's actual facts, and then there's legends about this movie. Yeah. And um, so there's a lot to talk about for sure. Do you remember your first? Do you remember the first time you saw Jaws? Well, one thing that I I totally remember was being a little kid, and uh, I don't know if it was right before Jaws was re-released or if it was still in theaters. But I remember my dad holding my hand as a toddler, walking through a movie theater uh, lobby, and there were all these giant people walking around me and popcorn spilling all over the place, cigarette smoke, and I remember cutting through all of that and seeing this bright blue poster with this giant monster 
on it. I didn't even know it was a shark, but that just, I saw that image and I was like, what is that? I got to see that. And, uh, I think Jaws was the first movie I ever saw. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, I was like a little kid, you know, as they say, it's PG movie, bring yeah. the kids, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> in, maybe too intense for young viewers. But, uh, for me, uh, I've just been fascinated with it. Um, I guess when I remember what I remember most fondly is sitting down with my dad and watching it when it premiered on uh, ABC uh, in the late seventies, I think it was November 79, you know, as we were watching this movie, what is he saying to her? What's what? Cause watch the reaction. He's been over there. What? what mm -hmm. Hey, 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 here right. we go. I mean, what was the line that he said? He's like, Hey baby, you want to, you want to check out the dunes? Yeah, a guy should write a book. Um, <laughs> it was like, the, it was like five seconds too. And they're yeah, all, I was like, here we go. And look at the reaction. Maybe he just um, told her his sign and that was all it took. There you go. It was like Pisces. But yeah, I remember watching Jaws with my dad when it premiered on, I think it was the ABC Sunday night movie and mm -hmm. they hyped that up so big and the commercials were all over the place. And I think there were ads in the paper for it. And I was old enough to, to be able to watch it and really appreciate it. And I remember just being terrified and thrilled and uh, just fascinated with the movie. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think I was afraid that night that Jaws was going to jump on my bed and be gobbled up like uh, <laughs> went. Yeah, because this movie tells us that it can jump, man. This is like they, they're not they're not stuck in the water. Like, he could have jumped on your bed. He could have just tipped the whole thing over. But look at these water angles here. It's so the way it's shot. Like she's so far from shore. Yeah. And it's so like, I mean, it's just taps into your fear of just what's out there in the dark. One of the things that I read, which, you know, maybe unreliable, maybe le maybe just legend, but it was like 25% of this movie is shot at water level or, or below water level. I don't know if it would be that much, but there's certainly a, a lot of it. In fact, uh, Bill Butler, who was the uh, cameraman on this, Mm -hmm. developed a uh, a camera box that allowed those shots to get right at water level where you could really get the camera wet and uh so yeah that, that, like that shot right there that's just so effective mm -hmm. the water splashing on the lens but not sticking on the lens i told my dad i was going to do this um during our father's day conversation we're recording this around <laughs> father's day to date it forever we're recording it around father's day and uh he was like, you know, I remember when I saw Jaws and it scared the ever loving pants off of me. And he was like, I was afraid because we so we're we kind of originated in the Florida area. Like he worked mm -hmm. for a long time. He actually met Roy Scheider for uh, like when Jaws 2 was filming. It was filming. Mm -hmm. They did some filming around Navarre Beach, which was, right. um, you know, kind of Pensacola. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he was he was doing some stuff. Now he was a he was in the grocery business, and so he, I think he said he cashed a check for Roy Scheider one of, <laughs> during during one of their. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the story behind that, but he says that's that's the story. He cashed a check for Roy Scheider at the grocery store. I had a Go cab. Ahead. I had a cab driver down in uh, the Destin area, um, mm -hmm. who who he he was like, yeah, I used to drive Roy Scheider around uh, when he was making Jaws too, and he told me, you know all these restaurants he'd go to and all this stuff. So funny that there's stories like that out there. Yeah. He uh, seems like he would have been a really down to earth guy. I never met him. Um, in your, uh, in your work on the shark is still working. Did you get to meet Roy Scheider? Well, um, we talked on the phone quite a bit. Okay. And, uh, Roy's part was filmed, uh, prior to me being involved. Um, I talked to him on the phone when he was doing, uh, the narration, for the documentary, which I think that just adds to the speciality of the shark still working, having Chief Brody mm -hmm. himself, you know, narrating it. Absolutely. But uh, I wrote him. I Roy Scheider's been, you know, he's known for Jaws, but Roy Scheider's been in a lot of great movies. And mm -hmm. me seeing this great performance in Jaws and just the adventure and everything, and I was just kind of like, hey, what else has this guy been in? And, uh, you know, as we go through this commentary, I'll, I'll touch on a few, you know, great Roy Scheider movies you ought to check out. Um, um, All right. But uh, but at this point, he'd been in The French Connection mm -hmm. and Seven Ups. So he was that New York tough guy cop kind of thing. 
And I like to think those movies were like Brody before he moved to uh, Amity Island. But uh, yeah, I, I did get to talk to Roy quite a bit. It was very special. He was kind of, you know, dealing with uh, his illness, uh, cancer, basically. Mm -hmm. Multiple uh, myeloma, I believe it was called. And uh, my mother at the time had uh, was going through a, a cancer diagnosis. And he, he was just so, you know, really kind to me. And uh, I'll just never forget those conversations. He used to say at the end of the call, uh, send your mother my love and save some of that love for yourself in that chief Brody voice. And oh man, I mean, he was his gr he was he was everything I would have wanted him to be in those conversations. That's and I was fantastic. sure to, I was just happy I got to tell him how much I've enjoyed his work, uh, not just for Jaws, but just as an artist and how it inspired me as a creative person. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's really great. Well, I, to answer the question I asked you, I don't remember the first time I saw Jaws. I'm, I think I'm a little bit younger than you in that this movie predates me. And I kind of just, it's always been there. Um, and I've had an interesting journey with it over the years, too, because it's it's always been around. And I remember watching all the Jaws movies on TV. And they kind of blended together. Like, oh, is that the mm. one with Michael Caine in it? Or is that... Uh, <laughs> then I got no. older, of course, and I find... <laughs> yeah. Hey, this time it's personal. Mm. Um, then I got... Oh, man. I I'm up it. for a commentary on that. Uh, you hey, do job? Let's do them all. I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll spoil it. I kind of like it. Ask, ask your, uh, your, your watchers if, if they would like that. I'd, I'd be all for it. But uh, yeah. I don't think there's there are some that are better than others, but there's no Jaws movies that I don't want to watch. I'll say that they're just fun. I yeah. mean, work. This, by the way, is a real arm that's buried in the sand. And uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. What? Just so we talk about this movie a little bit. Yeah, that was uh, the uh, the arm that they showed there was actually a, a someone working on the film that they buried in the sand because oh, they it, okay. it didn't look the prop didn't look real enough. But uh, that scene actually also, I believe, was the first scene shot for the movie. Them walking down the beach to that uh, discovery. And, uh, you know, just I watch this movie, everything comes comes to me. But uh, this uh, room that Chief Brody is, uh, and it's basically his office. If you go to Martha's Vineyard, now, I mean, you can go to Martha, Martha's Vineyard and have a great time and not know anything about Jaws. It's just a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. But I got to go for uh, Jaws Fest in 2012 uh, when the Blu-ray came out. And you know, I made a point to go to all these places. And it's basically unchanged. And uh, this uh, office is actually part of an art gallery. So they're all right now there's probably a lot of uh, black and white photography and laminates uh, all over the place. But when you walk in, you know you're, at Chief, you're in Chief Brody's office. And uh, like so these places are accessible if you ever want to go up there. It's 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 amazing. You feel like you're in the movie. Like this scene here, you could film that today if you had forty two year old Roy Scheider walk down the road for you. That's that's really cool. So they've kind of embraced it and preserved. Uh, well, so is the is the Orca two that was in Martha's Vineyard two, right? They had kind of put it there on the on the or beach. Orca two was like the ship that they built towards the, that towards the end is sinking. Mm -hmm. you know, that basically we're always hanging on to uh, during the finale and it was built to sink and rise and then yeah. there's the actual orca which they took back to uh universal city yeah um which has but, a yeah the, that story has a sad ending too yeah unfortunately these boats are, are no longer no longer around of course the sharks weren't uh preserved and just the the, the type of material that they're they're encased in uh, mm -hmm. just didn't uh survive time but on a plus side one of the sharks made from the mold of the original jaws um is uh, actually you know it was salvaged and they're actually uh, greg nicotero who's popular from the walking dead mm -hmm. uh, not also is in the shark is still working um he's actually working i believe with some other folks and getting it uh, refurbished back to its original shape so that should be in a museum soon oh wow and I'm definitely going to go check that out because that'd yeah, be me too. to see. I got to meet Joe Alves. I believe that's mm -hmm. Alves, right? Yeah, I got to meet him at uh, Wonderfest a few years ago, four years ago maybe. Yeah. Um, and he had some of the 
I, I don't know if they were original props or not, but he had some of the Jaws stuff there. Um, and he he had so much to do with the design of the um, of the sure. shark itself. So right. the the jowls, the the function. You want to talk a little bit about the the design of the, well, we, well, I mean, yeah, we, we, we will talk about how that shark was uh, designed. But yeah, Joe Alves, who eventually we were talking about sequels, went on to direct uh, Jaws 3D, but uh, was famed for being a production designer. For you know, of course, Jaws, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, mm-hmm. and uh, what else did he work on? I think he was second unit director on Jaws too. So it made sense when they when it came time to film Jaws three. You know, hey, this guy's mm-hmm. part of the team. Um, but yeah, he had a big part in designing and choosing Martha's Vineyard as well. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I also think it's kind of cool that um, Bob Matty um, mm-hmm. had a, a, a his now. See, I love <laughs> the twenty thousand leagues under the sea. Under the sea. It, exactly, <laughs> it's one of my one of my favorite uh, creature features, I guess. And just the, the symmetry of that—that that he had so much to do with, like the the mechanical aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it just feels so so appropriate that. Uh, that the guy who was in charge of the squid this is a squid creature right it's basically like a giant squid right uh in 20,000 leagues that he is uh manning jaws basically yeah in this yeah. movie i don't know if that's that's something you guys talk about in the documentary that i thought was really cool i lo- i love stuff like that when you when you see like history the thing you said about the birds too when hollywood history has this loop back on itself and it gets acknowledged or res- respected that's so important to me and it, that's and it all, uh, yeah ties yeah. together and yeah shows one thing li- leads to another and um yeah that's great another thing that i thought was really interesting about this is that uh a lot of it's improvised like so much mm-hmm. so many of the classic moments that we think about weren't necessarily planned they just kind of happened or they were improv on the scene Yes. A lot of local actors and things like that, too. What? We're we're almost 15 minutes into this movie, and we're already setting up our second victim. Mm-hmm. So, you know, modern a lot of modern audiences tend to criticize Jaws when I look at reviews, when I can bear to look at some of these more recent reviews from modern moviegoers. They talk about, oh, it's the pacing. I mean, we're already looking at Shark attack number two. Actually, the dog's about to get it too. Pippet. Rest in peace, Pippet. Pip. They actually have a the real dog has a burial spot on Martha's yeah. Vineyard because he's so uh, renowned. Now the kid on the raft, his name is uh, he's in the shark is still working. His name is uh, Jeffrey Voorhees, and I should point out he's of no relation to Jason Voorhees. <laughs> but uh, his name was Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> so he's a. Uh, a local celebrity basically he's a i believe he's a restaurateur now oh on wow the island. um this guy cracks me up yeah Roy, roy's just not having any of this look at him he's had enough the cinematography this just this scene with him kind of leaning back it's fantastic <laughs> it's classic and this works on like a silent film level you're just you, yeah which is partially lends itself to why it's so internationally mm-hmm. renowned but uh and the one thing about roy when when you watch me he communicates he's an actor that i enjoy because he communicates so much by not saying much mm-hmm. he uses you know his every muscle in his face and his eyes and he has an intensity and a vulnerability about him that just makes him relatable yeah, it's it's deceptive because you could look at it and be like, well, he's not really doing anything, but he actually is. It's right. a style of acting. It's a naturalistic style of acting, but that doesn't mean that he's not performing. Yeah, I think some, sometimes that's lost these days. Yeah, that's some bad hat, Harry. That's some bad hat, Harry. That's right. Olivia Newton-John playing in the background. Classic. So the, the shark attack here, which is pretty brutal on its own. Yeah. Um, they're actually, if you, 
I don't know if you recall when you saw the shark is still working, but there's actually footage in our documentary that shows uh, they they intended to show the mechanical shark basically chewing this guy up. And uh, I don't know, they decided, that, I guess, less is more in this case. And uh, or they maybe they just couldn't get the shot they desired with the mechanical shark, um, which plagued the movie, but actually worked to its benefit. But even though you don't see the shark, this is so like effective. It's the thing. It's more effective because you don't yeah. see it. It's the yeah. Hitchcock thing. What's your what your mind is imagining is worse than what they could have done. I mean, then then you got that. Is, oh yeah, that's just. Oh, then you hear him going. That's actually the, the voice you hear going look look when he's getting chewed up. That's actually uh, Susan Bacalini, who was the first victim. Um, they uh, overdubbed her just to add that little extra touch. Wow. You know this. There's so many, I'm trying to think how I want to say this. This movie is as good as it is because of accidents. I mean, if the shark had worked like they wanted it to, it, who's to say if it would have had the effect that it has in this movie? So much of this movie, it, it's just a perfect storm. You know, Directors will tell you this. They'll be like, well, you can aim for this, and then you can try for this, you can plan for this, but what happens when you get out there is it, it, can, it can be completely different. And... I think the story behind this movie is as interesting as the movie itself because it, it's so it was it was uh, I'm not going to say a disaster that might be overstating it but nothing seemed to have gone to plan and I actually think that the movie is so much stronger because of that because of the human element because of what was done to to compensate for some of the things that weren't quite ready yet or they just couldn't quite get nailed down. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to come off as some cynical guy, but uh, the uh, the ingenuity that, that went into making this movie is part of what fascinates me about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they didn't just rely on computers or, you know, 20 different special effects units uh, working on a computer with mouses. I mean, we're talking about building a 25-foot mechanical shark and parking it, you know, off the coast of Martha's Vineyard in the actual ocean and steering a boat around it and making an effective thriller um, that, you know, it really stands, has stood the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time. I mean, the, the ingenuity to pull that off, uh, you know, if they made it now, and let's hope they never do remake Jaws. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, you know, this this movie, even if they do, this this movie stands on its... In a place yeah. all, all to its own. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I hadn't even thought about that until you said that just now. They, <laughs> I could see someone remaking Jaws. You know, we got this property. Everybody knows the name. They have, they, they haven't seen those movies are from years ago. They haven't seen them. Let's let's revive it and let's make a new one. We'll cast Sometimes Chris I'm Pratt. Wondering. Yeah, yeah, Chris Pratt as Quint. Quick, Chris Pratt as Brody. Chris, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, if, if anyone could eyeball this movie to, to remake it and, and feel like they should have a crack at it. You know, mm -hmm. I've actually heard Spielberg kind of mention an interest in it, but I don't know if that's for real or if it was just some clickbait article. But like he would want to do it again? Yeah, I've seen interviews where he talks about like, you know, if I could, I'm intrigued by the thought of making Jaws now, knowing what all I could do with it, but... I don't know. Maybe I just maybe that's just some article I read or some rumor that, you know, might I don't not know, man. Given the, given the trajectory of his career in the last few years with things like Ready Player One, I, I that wouldn't surprise me. Oh, here's Quint. Here's our introduction. It doesn't surprise me, man. What a great character. It's yeah. just the best. You all know me. I love that drawing on the chalkboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have a T-shirt with that on it. I bet there are people that have that as a tattoo. Yeah, Maybe. I, like his, I like his little toady guy too. There's some uh, deleted scenes. The guy that you see over to the the right, that's got his dog. Um, there's some great deleted scenes with with this guy. He's an actual fisherman, obviously, and and they're they're trying to get him to act opposite Robert Shaw, and it's just not working out. But it's still <laughs> great to it's still great to see. 
That's hilarious. Sorry, I mean sucked into the movie. I um, know. He, he's very magnetic. You know, you don't just casually watch Robert Shaw. He kind of commands, Uh-oh. commands the scene. He he left us too soon. Um, yeah, I know he had some demons, but it's just a shame. For that, you get the head, the tail, the eyes, the gills, <laughs> and the tail. There's some some of the guys that did a shark is still working. I made a a comedy film called All That Jaws, and <laughs> my friend Mike uh, Roddy actually had had that line. It's pretty funny. It's like airplane meets Jaws. I don't know. That if you Google fantastic. it, it's probably out there somewhere. It's pretty funny, oh, actually. I gotta I gotta check that out. All that Jaws. It just looks every shot of this thing is just so beautiful. Um. I don't want to just gush about the cinematography, but it is a beautiful movie. Yeah, m- mostly shot handheld. Mm. This yeah, is actually on. this right here is actually a pretty good scare when he turns. <laughs> <laughs> if you have the volume up, it's it's made me jump a few times. Even the dog was a little bit put out. It's like, what? like what's up with that? What, what's the matter with you? Why? Um, this movie was huge. Uh, I, I said it, I kind of teased it at the beginning or I just outright said it, but this is arguably the first blockbuster. Now, obviously we have our Lawrence of Arabia's and our Gone with the Winds and things like that. But when we talk about a modern blockbuster, I think uh, upon its original release, I read like 67 million people went to see this movie. That's true. Yeah. It's uh, the first movie to cross a hundred million dollars, which back in 1975 was quite a chunk of change. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think worldwide it's grossed 470 million. I don't know the box office figures so well, but but it was yeah it it uh, basically was was passing movies such as The Exorcist, which was quite a phenomenon mm-hmm. when it came out. Um, I think it got to around 80 million, and then uh, The Godfather. Uh, was right around there as well. So movies like that, you know, were, were the competition, I guess. And I don't really know if people were as focused on box office like like we are these days. But uh, the success of this movie was so substantial that, you know, obviously uh, it, it became part of the conversation because, yeah, like, as you say, 67 million people. Um, it's quite a few people. Yeah, and that's in a time when there weren't <laughs> as many people as there are walking the planet Earth. Right, right. Now, that this is like a probably a quarter of the population. I mean, everybody saw this movie. This thing was huge. Mm-hmm. And it kind of kicked off that whole uh, rivalry between, well, it was the birth of Steven Spielberg as the blockbuster you know, filmmaker. And then a few years later, Close Encounters of the Third Kind versus Star Wars. And it was just back and forth between him and Lucas. Yeah, but and, uh, Lucas actually, Lucas actually, you know, has his own stories about this movie and was quite a part of it as far as just behind the scenes and just uh, like, I, for example, he recommended uh, Richard Dreyfus because he had just worked with him on American Graffiti. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a funny story about uh, Lucas visiting the set and getting his head stuck in the, the mechanical shark. <laughs> uh, these guys were all friends, uh, Spielberg, George Lucas, Brian De Palma. Milius, Francis, Milius, John Milius. Oh, I love John Milius movies. Um, and then uh, I lost my train of thought on the the other. Francis, you can say Francis Ford. Francis Ford Coppola. Coppola. Yeah. So like these guys were like the the new kids in you know in town, and um, they were all talented. And uh, yeah. yeah, I guess they were they had a a friendly competition. Um. So. The movie, I guess, is all the better for it. I mean, Milius actually contributed uh, to the Indianapolis speech that comes up later. You know, this scene right here with the uh, with the doc, mm-hmm. there was an actually uh, an al- alternative uh, scene that was considered for this spot in the film, which is the a harbor master, you know, going to rinse out a, a pot or something and reaching down into the ocean off of a dock. And as he's doing that unknowingly in front of him, the mass of boats rocking 
getting closer to him, mm-hmm. you know, representing the mass of a shark coming uh, to take him. So that was, I guess they they didn't have the time or means to pull that off. But, you know, if you were to describe to me, well, you know, if they did film that, look at this shot right here. I mean, that's, that's so creepy. It's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Why did that guy get pulled off the dot? Just the whole thing going in and him getting dragged under. That's just horrible. I mean, but if you were to describe me, if that scene was in the movie and, and this was the, the, the rumored scene, um, this is really the way to go because, I mean, two guys get knocked off a dock, thrown a piece of meat, shark <laughs> turns around and comes after him, rips the dock up. I mean, that's pretty cool. Can't climb it because it's wet. Give me a yep. When when we were kids, you know, like maybe your friend would see a movie and you hadn't seen it yet. And so they would tell you about it. Like you'd be on the trampoline or something like that. And they'd tell you in the backyard, like, oh, yeah. And then like they were on the dock and they just pulled the whole dock. You'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah. I had it's a big... that Hitchcock thing where the imagination, it just it just runs away with you. Here's the harbor master that probably would have uh, he would have been uh, chomped up. Probably he. He's going to go eat some cereal. This guy's my, he's my spirit animal. Yeah. <laughs> so many locals in this movie. Yep. What's everybody arguing about? Just calm down. What do you think about Richard Dreyfus in this movie? I know you told us that like Lucas had George Lucas had suggested him, but what do you think about him in this movie? I mean, I, mean, I, I don't put you on the I, spot, I, but I, uh, I mean, I, 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 I like I, with Richard Dreyfus. What were you gonna say? I've always struggled with Richard, with Richard Dreyfus. You've struggled with Richard Dreyfus. Well, you know, he's he's got the. Um, unfortunate role of being kind of the middle guy between Quint and Brody. I mean, Brody, you get established with him right at the beginning of the movie mm-hmm. and you're kind of watching all this happen and experiencing this through his eyes and his feelings. Check out that guy's Budweiser hat. <laughs> um, but uh, Dreyfus, you know, um, oh, I was going to say, and then you've got, on the other hand, you've got Quint, uh, who's, you know, just so iconic and i mean that character is just so bold um so you've got you know hooper and um you know he doesn't have you know when dreyfus was making this movie he he felt like it didn't you know give him much to do Mm -hmm. but until he saw it he didn't realize that you know this is this is you know a great role for him um he adds a lot of comic relief um he does add some intensity um, he is a bit, uh, <laughs> yeah. he, he is a bit, uh, I mean, he does stick out a little bit cause his character is not, you know, he's, he's basically a, a kind of a spoiled rich kid that, uh, you know, just on the scene because of this shark that's going around. So I, yeah. I don't really have, I can't imagine anyone other than Dreyfus. I don't really, you know, I can understand how he can kind of stick out a little bit at times some of his mannerisms might be a little over the top but it just adds to the like if you watch jaws in a in a theater with a lot of people you hear a lot of laughs Mm -hmm. and a lot of those laughs come from dreyfus and uh you know dreyfus has done a lot of great great movies i was talking about roy before but you know some some great richard dreyfus movies that if you haven't seen something like the goodbye girl Mm -hmm. um have you ever seen that movie? Yeah, a long, long time ago. That's such a good movie. I mean, he's so good in that. Um, of course, Close Encounters. Right. But uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't really mind Dreyfus. He's he's certainly a, a unique type of actor in this movie, though. He yeah. I'm, I don't mean to say that I don't like him. I've just kind of struggled with him, like trying to find an in for who he is and what like what his just just who he is. You know, I. I read it could, have been, it could have been a lot worse because in the book, uh, Hooper has a romance with uh, Ellen Brody. And he's just, he's kind of a jerk in the book. He's not very likable. And he yeah. actually gets eaten, gets his uh, just desserts later. But look at him here. He's very intense. I mean, I think this is. Yeah. 
And he's like this. He knows the moment he looks at this that you know there's something, something bad going down here. Mm-hmm. He makes a pot like a, a a tower of uh, like a mountain out of the innards, and he's like, "This he, means something." He gives the movie a, a, a <laughs> he gives the movie a little jolt of electricity at times. Like this, right? This is this is good stuff right here. Do you know about the Coast Guard about this? That's a good way to that's a good way to sum it up. Yeah, he does. I, I read that Steven Spielberg. Um, said that when he read the book he found himself rooting for the shark because the characters are so unlikable the books you know it's 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 interesting to read it for sure and it's you know as a book I, it it has elements to it that are great and some of it i'm like why is why is this in this book um <laughs> but i don't think eventually it had really gotten the swing of writing at that mm-hmm. point so there's there might be a few spots in there that are questionable but Obviously, he went on to write a lot of great books, but John yeah. still is great. That that the, the the last half when you're on the boat, I mean that's uh, timeless. It's great stuff. And Absolutely, Quint's, Quint's there. There's a lot of Quint in the book. So, I think that the dynamic between Quint, well, between Robert Shaw and Richard Dreyfus. The 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 actors, not even necessarily the characters, but the, the thing that I enjoy is the the adversarial relationship between the two of them in this movie because they were so different in real life. And um, I mean, you guys talked about that in that documentary as well, just that there was a lot of <laughs> there was like, a lot Hoop, of Hooper's just like uh uh-uh. uh this is this is not good. Yeah, he is, and he's great in these scenes. There's a scene coming up where he's telling Roy and the mayor, look, this may be the shark. Quint's just laughing at him. He knows. What a beautiful, iconic boat. You all right there? I got a cat going crazy. Did you fall down the steps? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And here we go. Yeah, it's a real shark, too. Yeah. Pro- pro- not a prop shark. Bet that didn't smell too good. Yeah, you ain't kidding. I find myself just wanting to watch these movies. It doesn't, it's so good. Um, this is the time of year. This is the time of year to, to pop it on. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I don't know that the treatment of sharks is, you know, Peter eventually said that if he really knew more about the way that sharks actually behave, he never would have written the book in the first place. Um, I don't know about that. But <laughs> but it taps into that feeling, you know, like, I don't know, I was watching the news the other day. There's been like two shark attacks in the last week. It yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, I mean, I, I, I've seen where sharks are, are recovering. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that's going on with sharks beyond just, you know, the fallout, the summer of 75 with, with Jaws. I mean, just the, the fin soup and the what a lot of these fleets do with. The cutting the fins off sharks and throwing them back in the water. I don't like seeing things like that. No. Um, but I, I think I heard that sharks are making a rebound, which you know, I guess depending on your your perspective, you know that's that's great. I mean, and I'm I'm all for for sharks being part of nature. I mean, they're there yeah. for a reason. Um, but um, <clears throat> as far as the entertainment value of this movie, I don't really think there's. I mean. There's there's a lot of things that the shark does that actually I've heard happen or, you know, it, even the cage scene that's filmed, uh, they filmed some live shark footage in Australia. Um, and um, there, there's the shark actually got into the cage and caught up in it and ripped the cage down to the bottom of the ocean floor. I mean, in that footage, you can see it on like the making of Jaws, the extended version of that documentary. And. I mean, it. The crazy things happen. Yeah, for sure. So let's just say, in this case, this particular shark. You know, and it, also there's that it's based on the, I believe it's the 1916, shark attacks in uh, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess there's a lot of that in the background. I mean, there are rumors sharks get as big as 35 feet or at least 21 feet on record. 
We're talking about a 25 foot shark here. Nothing too extraordinary about it, but you know, I, I just like watching this movie and I, I just, uh, I don't really have to watch something and worry about if it's scientifically hundred percent accurate. Oh no, but it scared the, it scared the pants off of people. That's what like my dad was telling me, like he couldn't go swimming. I, I never finished that story. After he saw Jaws, he stopped going swimming in the Gulf because <laughs> this movie messed them up so much. And I think this movie messed up a lot of people because it's, it's it, it, I, it whether oh, yeah. it's scientifically accurate or not, it's uh, close enough to reality that it yeah. really gets in your head. I don't think. I mean, it's like it's like Psycho. You know, you get in the shower sometimes. You might think, did I hear something out there? Out there is you know, like the shower scene in uh, Psycho. It does it does the same thing. Jaws does the same thing in in the ocean. You mm-hmm. know, there's no way you're not going to go swim deep in the ocean and not start. You know, thinking about this movie or start hearing the Jaws theme in your head. The scene where Roy got slapped. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna come back to that because that's some incredible grief acting right there from that lady. Yeah, Lee Fierro is her name, and I believe she's still up in uh, Martha's Vineyard. She was a a, a local uh, actress, um, heavily involved in community theater, and I. I you know, I, I got to meet her in 2012, and she was so sweet. Um, I gave her my soundtrack, and did she slap like, you? She's like, "I'm going to go home and listen to this," and I really appreciate. She was so sweet. Uh, gave me and my wife a kiss, and just the nicest lady. Wow. And um, so, uh, but but yeah, she uh, had gone years under the impression that Roy, you know, didn't like her very much because she had to smack him 17 times. <laughs> um, she didn't smack me. She says like she doesn't smack people because people have been asking her to do it, and she won't do it anymore. Um, but she's just a very sweet lady. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she was concerned about that, and um, the guys when they filmed Roy, they actually filmed him telling her, you know, that the reason he was so intense that day is he had to act like that slap wasn't coming. And um, he, he said on the video, you like, you know, if if I came across as stern or anything, I was just trying to stay in that moment because I had to act like that. I didn't know that was going to hit me. You were going to hit me. And uh, it was very, very nice to see him say that, send that message to her. Yeah. He sounds like a great guy. This actually was his favorite scene or one of his favorite scenes in the movie, the kid uh, uh, imitating him. Mm -hmm. Because it was, real right like it was not scripted yeah. or planned it just kind of happened yeah in between shots he was kind of like hey this kid's imitating me and he went and got spielberg and they went ahead and filmed it which is like you were saying before a lot of this was improv mm-hmm. happy accidents say but like here Dreyfus is a bit of fresh air after this rather solemn kind of situation brody's in he's and he relates to what brody's going through these guys actually got to be pretty, really good friends in real life. You're convincing me in real time. Talk to me more and more into Dreyfus's performance in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about, do you know anything about the rumors about a, a Charlton Heston having once been considered for the, the Quint role? Is there any um, truth to that? Do you know? It was Brody. Oh. Yeah. My mistake. So. But, um, I mean, if you look at Charlton Heston, and I, I love a lot of Charlton Heston movies, uh, like The Omega Man, which was just a few years before this. Um, but, like, uh, oh, of course, Planet of the Apes and all that stuff. But, like, uh, if you had to think about Charlton Heston versus a shark, <laughs> yeah, you know the shark's not got a chance. So, yeah. I mean, I guess that's why, but yeah, apparently he wasn't very happy about not getting that role. I think he was in Airport 75 instead. Uh, I always, I swear, every time I open a bottle of wine, I think about, you want to let that breathe a minute? <laughs> Which is what's coming up here from Dreyfus. But yeah, I mean, right here you've got just, you've got Lorraine Gary, you know, her performance 
um, you know, in Jaws of Revenge and things like that, people will joke about that. But here, I mean, she's doing this great kind of um, intense acting. You know, she's just emotional and upset about what's going on, but she's trying to smooth things out and be there for her husband and whatnot. So you've got, you know, she's kind of intense. You got Roy here who's just had it. Look at him. He's, he's pouring that drink. He's mm-hmm. just getting a little tipsy. And you got Dreyfus here. Hey, 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 hey. Uh, and I, I just love the dynamic here with these with these guys. Yeah. That was my end for this movie when I came back to it, I guess, as an adult. is um, I went through – I'm, I'm going to be honest. I went through a phase – late 90s i picked this up on dvd when dvd was brand new and i didn't connect to it like i wanted to and it took i I really wrestled with it for a while i was like why am i you know it's like well the special effects you know this is a mechanical shark whatever i don't know what my problem was but then like on just a little bit later i came to a realization that it's not about the shark it's about the relationship between these people it's about the characters it's always about the characters um right and that was my in. And as soon as I discovered that, as soon as I found that for myself, this movie became flawless for me. So we were, right. you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, kids talk. People say, I say kids, <laughs> um, <laughs> modern audiences, kids these days, modern audiences will say uh, maybe the pacing is a little bit slower or something like that. I, I think you just need an end for it. And when you really realize this, it's a story about people and it's about characters and it's about these men from different walks of life coming together to defeat a common problem. It cracks the whole thing and it's beautiful. It's actually flawless. I actually, right. I think there's a case to be made. This might be a perfect movie. I, to me, this is the best movie ever made. I love it. I've gotten so much enjoyment out of watching it through the years. I mean, you know, the first time you watch Jaws, it's it's a horror movie, kind of. It's scary, and mm-hmm. it makes you jump. The second time you watch it, it's an adventure movie. Um, um, I mean, it's almost, it's the second half of it, when they're on the boat hunting the shark. I mean, that's just timeless, and yeah. you, it's almost like a pirate adventure in, at, at times. So... And then, you know, it also functions on a dramatic level. And then there's a lot of funny, you know, layers to it. So it just works on so many levels. I mean, uh, you know, I guess if you're going to be cynical and, and you know, find some something about it, how it was filmed and the technology or what whatever was available, you know. I mean, look at movies nowadays. People are complaining about the human elements in the uh, new Godzilla movie. Uh, people want you know human beings that they can connect with well you know you, you they threw all that money and technology at that movie you know i had a good time with it but mm-hmm. you can't beat having human people. characters that are interesting and um you know and good actors too that's a big part of it yeah, that's what I said in my Godzilla review for when i when i reviewed it for my youtube channel as i was mentioning that like you know we we talk about Jurassic Park, another Spielberg movie. Is Jurassic Park about dinosaurs or is it about the people that we are hoping escape from that park? Right. Um, if we didn't care about those people, would we really care about the movie? I guess some people might because they just want the ride. They just want the spectacle. But for me, it always has to come back to the people. Um, and when you say that about Spielberg <laughs> saying that the rumor that he would have loved to he would love to take a crack at it. You know, I assume with with CGI is what we're talking about. Like, well, if I could make the shark look like whatever I wanted to, I could really. But that's not the point. The point isn't how good the shark looks, which I think the shark looks pretty good um, when we do see it in glimpses yeah. and side shots and things like that. But uh, that would take away from the things that make this movie special. It's so interesting. Sometimes the people that are closest to these movies are not aware of what it is that makes them so appealing. Um this right, movie's, right. This movie's about the, the journey. Yeah. I, I don't think Spielberg likes to reflect on this too much just because there's just so much pain. And, mm-hmm. you know, he went through quite a bit of a struggle getting this made. But we should talk some about that. This movie was really difficult for him. This movie just about broke him. Well, he, he was, um, you know, he had previously made uh, for Zanuck and Brown the Sugarland Express. Mm hmm. With Goldie Hawn in 1974, and um, 
I think they were filming this when that movie came out, actually. Um, but, I mean, he wasn't like Steven Spielberg, as we all know him now. You know, there there wasn't really a lot of uh, confidence, I suppose, from, from the studio side, from is what I understand. But I, I get the impression Zanuck and Brown were, were there with him. Um, and I would imagine Sid Scheinberg, who was... Uh, uh, a big player at Universal, also, you know, married to Lorraine Gary. I wouldn't imagine him wanting to see this movie fail or fire the director or anything like that. But I think when you consider the budget, I think the budget for this was, you know, half what it ended up being, which I believe was around $8 million. Mm. Um, so, I mean, obviously, when you go over budget, that's probably not the best thing. And he's trying to you know, make everybody happy artistically, trying to get everybody home. Because I, I think uh, this was filmed over, it was like 150 days or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was supposed to be maybe six weeks or eight weeks or something like that. It wasn't, wasn't supposed to be a long shoot. It ended up going for, for months, months and months. Do you know anything about the rumors that, I, I, they might not even be rumors, but I read it on IMDb, so that doesn't mean that it's true. But that there was an original, <laughs> there was another director attached to this project before Spielberg, Dick Richards. Yeah, there, there was. There, well, they had a talk with 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 this director, and you know they kind of called him in, and they were all talking about you know where to go with it. And apparently, Dick Richards um, wanted uh, kept referring to the shark as the whale. <laughs> and uh like they kept correcting him and then finally they were like look it's a shark it's not a whale and the um apparently he always wanted to make a movie about a whale and was trying to sell that angle on it which you know obviously we're going to get Moby Dick comparisons from that so i guess they uh you know they didn't uh go with him and Spielberg apparently saw the script you know lay- laying around in a universal office i guess maybe Zanuck or Brown's office took it home and read it and said, hey, how about me for this? And Dick Richards went on to make Free Willy. That's not true. I'm just kidding. Uh, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that would be, yeah. Poor Dick Richards, you know, he would have. Which, by the fun. way, if my name was Richard Richards, that's what I would go by. I wouldn't go by Dick Richards. I'd be Richard Richards. Yeah. Well, <laughs> can't argue also, with that. I'd also maybe be a rapper. I don't know. Richard Richards. Um, yeah. <laughs> So this when? obviously uh, coming up here, we've got one of the best jolts in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that man. When I was a kid and I saw this scene, it's it stayed with me for a while. <laughs> so this was actually kind of reshot after the film was cut together, and this is uh, what I understand is this is in uh, Verna Field, the editor's pool, and so there's like a tarp over it, and there they poured a lot of milk in the water to make it kind of, you know, unclear. And, uh, they built, you know, this wood prop for the boat and just filmed a bunch of takes of this head popping out here. And right here though, when you've never seen this movie before, you're just waiting for the shark to swim up and get them. Yeah. And And I don't, go ahead. I don't know what it is about the timing on the, on that. I mean, I've seen it, hundreds of times now so obviously i don't jump but I've, I've watched it with friends and if you ever show this movie to a friend and you know they've never you know seen seen it before be sure and crank the volume up without them knowing about it before that head pops up and they'll <laughs> i guarantee you they'll jump up about three feet in the air um i've scared a lot of friends that way <laughs> you've lost a lot of friends that way <laughs> <laughs> you, you might be right it's just so gross, man. There's like the junk coming out of the eye hole. It's yeah, a really, I don't it's know a, what. I don't know what happened to him, but yeah, something got him. Yeah, I dig this guy's jacket too. I feel like this is something you could find in the Gap today, like right now. He was ahead of his time. He was. I don't know if this was in fashion in 1975, but you know about this scene. Look at this intensity of this acting here. Look at these guys. You don't. I mean, when do you get this now? It's not not very often. Chris Pratt. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, if you look at Meg, I love the, the Meg book. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, uh, Eric Hollander, the, one of the guys that did the shark with us, the director and a good friend of mine, he actually did the logo uh, for the Meg. 
Uh, he does all the book, co- a lot of the book covers for Steve Alton. But, <clears throat> you know, he and I have talked about Meg quite a bit. And just, you know, why, why couldn't they approach just been a little more like this, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, this, look at that acting. It's the seventies, man. We we lost something when the seventies ended. There was a an intensity oh, that only seems to have lived in the seventies. Because in the eighties, we moved on to other things, and we've never really gone back. There was a, maybe in the late nineties, we kind of flirted with it again. But uh, I love that billboard. But now those there's just something that makes seventies movies special. Some people. I hear this a lot. Some people consider the 70s the greatest movie for film, uh, the greatest era for film ever. Yeah. Uh, because of stuff like me, this. You can put me down on that list. You know, this billboard, they had to uh, put it up and take it down the same day they shot it. They, the <laughs> island uh, authorities demanded, you know, that this, the island be as pristine as it was before they filmed, mm-hmm. you know, in a lot of these places. Yeah, you probably wouldn't want your tourists to see that either. But here we here again, Dreyfus doing a great job here. Yeah, and being funny and intense and relatable and all those good things. I think it's his intensity that I struggle with. If I like, I'm trying to pinpoint it. I it, it, he just seems so, he's so high strung. He just makes me nervous and. But it works opposite Roy's kind of yeah coolness. Well, and Shaw's. Just, whatever that is <laughs> saltiness yeah salt that's exactly because i don't think they got along in real life either i mean they it's got like a, they got along after a while i think but it was only after he drove dreyfus to the point of saying all right that's enough is what i understand anyway mm. so when you go to martha's when you come in on a ferry like this and uh, it's a beautiful sight when you come in and you're seeing everything, you know, from that ferry. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna have to schedule a trip, man. It sounds, oh, it's it's the sounds best. really cool. I love it. Wouldn't it be cool if I could do a, a serial at midnight location video for the the location for Jaws? Right. That'd be awesome. With Mike McCormick. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> We'll so, uh, yeah, while we have this montage plan, I want to talk a little bit about Roy Scheider and some recommended movies. Um, so my short list, I'm actually working on a video I want to put on my on my channel. But uh, so maybe look look for Roy Scheider recommended movies at some point. I'm going to put this up. Hopefully, what's your channel? Up. Talk about your channel. Hopefully it'll stay up. Um, s- soundtrack TV is what I call it. Uh, it's got a lot of my music on there, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of wanting to do. A little, I've got a few movie things on there. I want to do a little bit more of that. Um, but I'll I'll have a link because uh, it's kind of a generic title. I don't. I should have put serial in the title, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll have it linked on my website. So you can you'll if you you know if you're listening to this and would like to, uh, you know, see some of my stuff or hear some of the music or whatnot, it'll be on my website, michaelmccormackmusic.com. Yeah, we'll have links to it too in the description yeah. of this. So, but anyway, uh, Roy Scheider. Okay, so have you seen The French Connection? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Love that movie. Um, and it, I don't know if you knew this. You mentioned uh, Charles Bron- or Charles Bronson, uh, Charlton Heston. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Char- uh, Gene Hackman was actually considered for Brody at one point. Um, great actor from back in the day. But um, also, have you have you seen the Seven Ups, which is kind of a spinoff from? I have not seen the Seven Ups, and I've heard great things. I need to see it. Yeah, it just got a uh, Blu-ray release through Twilight Time. I think it's already gone, though. I think it's already uh, it out probably has come and gone, but um, I don't know. You'll yeah, have to, I'll get a, I'll get a hold you, of it somehow. You can come visit and watch it. Um, but anyway, it's the best. It has one of the best car chases you'll ever see. I swear, I think it goes on for 11 minutes. And it is just full-on fun stuff to watch. Um, well, French Connection has some great car chases in it. Oh, too. yeah. It's so made by the same people. Okay. 
the same uh, same folks. So that's what um, they do. Yeah, and then uh, so Scheider followed uh, Jaws obviously with uh, Marathon Man, mm-hmm. Dustin Hoffman, Lawrence Olivier. Yeah, uh, he has a great fight scene in that. Uh, have you ever seen Sorcerer, made by William Friedkin? Yeah, I, you know I've seen again a long time ago, like video video story blockbuster video days. I yeah. saw that. I, I need to revisit. It that just one. got a it just got a great uh, Blu-ray release. And again, it was made by William Freakin, who made French Connection and Exorcist. Mm-hmm. So he was, he was at his full powers. Apparently, um, he halfway, you know, it was such a hard shoot that Roy just about, you know, short circuited making that one. I mean, they're out in like the jungle, and I don't know. I've heard a lot of crazy stories about that movie, but it's great. And actually, Freakin considers it his best movie. Um, Sorcerer, he sorcer- considered, yeah. Oh wow, over The Exorcist and over, yeah, it's his favorite movie. Wow. If you ever get bored, Google William Friedkin uh, or, or, or search him on YouTube. He's all over the place talking about his films, and he is he can talk. He is hilarious. Um, <laughs> he's got some great stories. Uh, but just moving on, uh, all that jazz, obviously. Yeah, we got nominated for Academy Award for that. Um, I love watching Blue Thunder. Um, have you seen Blue Thunder, the helicopter? No. Oh, Heath, you got to watch that one. Are you just going to quiz me on things I haven't seen and expose me? It's just a oh, okay, okay. No. <laughs> well, anyway, well, no. That my 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 purpose. Part of my purpose here is you got to want. There's so many great Roy Scheider movies. I mean, he was in the sequel to uh, 2001. Yeah, 20, uh, 2010. 2010. Yeah. Not not quite as good as 2001, but still a solid movie. And then there's a movie he made called uh, The Fourth War, made by John Frankenheimer, around 1990. Uh, it's just a good, good solid movie. So I'll end it there. But uh, I really like the Mar- I really like Marathon Man. I think the, right. he's super cool in that movie. He's kind of like a almost like a secret agent in it's that almost movie. like a james bond kind of thing yeah there's that scene where he comes he's in there in paris he comes out of his window and there's like the eiffel tower in the background and someone comes up behind him and tries to kill him oh yeah super cool stuff uh so if people haven't said see there's one i've seen so <laughs> he was uh, highly he was really proud of that fight scene because apparently they were going to do it you know kind of just a like a bar room brawl kind of thing and mm-hmm. He apparently had them creatively change that into a more strategic assassins confrontation. But anyway, not to get on a tangent on 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 other movies, but you know, also with with uh, Robert Shaw, obviously uh, great movies that he's he was in, uh, friend, uh, from Russia with Love, mm-hmm. um, Red Grant. You know that famous fight on the train. I go back yeah. and forth. I was talking about this lately with uh, just a few days ago with some people. I I I. I'm torn between Dr. No and from Russia with love as the most pure Connery bond. Yeah. Um, depends on what mood I'm in. Sometimes I prefer Dr. No. Sometimes I prefer from Russia with love, but that he's so great in that movie and that movie. If people only know bond is like the big gadgets and the one liners and stuff, you got to check out from Russia with love. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I kind of liked what they were doing with the Dalton bond movies, but that's mm-hmm. a whole nother, uh, that's a whole that's- nother, podcast yeah. um but yeah uh, another well i mentioned the fourth war with roy scheider uh black sunday in 1977 was also made by john frankenheimer and uh it involves um uh robert shaw's like on the trail of these terrorists that are trying to blow up a super bowl with a, a, a goodyear blimp uh really cool uh mm-hmm. exciting thriller um and then he was also in the deep Shortly thereafter, Jaws. Yeah. So, I mean, all these guys wasn't have, the have a great body of Peter, work. Wasn't the Deep yeah. also a Peter Benchley novel? Uh huh. Also, uh, yeah. a few years after that, The Island with Michael Caine, uh, which was Michael crazy. Caine. Michael Caine. Michael. You say it used to be pronounced as in my cocaine. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. <laughs> Shocks come and go, Alan. I gotta say about Roy Scheider, while we're it's like the Roy Scheider Admiration Society. Uh, this is a weird thing to point out, but I'm gonna point it out. Like he's a tiny man. He looks like he weighs about 120 pounds, soaking wet. But he is super masculine, and he seems like he, 
And I'm thinking specifically of that fight we were talking about in Marathon Man. Like he's like doing push ups and doing all this crazy stuff, like sit ups and stuff, working out. And we equate I'm gonna make my third reference and then I'm gonna let it go. Like Chris Pratt is like the ideal of <laughs> of modern movie movie star or whatever. Roy Scheider is pretty like he's pretty tough, man. He looks like muscle and gristle like he just looks like he could really take care of himself yeah and he has and he has this this temper that he'll he'll show yeah uh and just he'll just explode on screen um you gotta yeah blue thunder you need to watch that there's some good stuff some okay. one-liners um, i'll be over there i'll be over there in a couple hours and we'll oh, sweet we'll do a marathon all right marathon um, man oh, oh, that's such a good shot right there back to jaws folks i'm sorry um <laughs> So this uh, shot that's coming up, well, actually this whole scene, you've got Teddy Grossman, the stunt man. And I just, I love how, you know, he's totally unaware of this fin coming at him. There's a shot. I love that right there. Look at that. Mm -hmm. He's so in trouble. Um, but there was uh, more, uh, they were actually going to do more with this. Now that shot right there is shot from the uh, uh, the mast of uh, the orca. Huh. The very front, I guess it's called the mast. The very front of the uh, oh man, the, where Quint usually is with his harpoon. So they actually filmed that. They took him out there and because to get that angle, that's actually shot out deep in the ocean. Now as this shot shot here, originally in the movie there was going to be a lot more. The shark was going to be coming at uh, Brody's kid. And Teddy Grossman was going to be hanging out of the mouth right above shore, coming at him. And uh, blood gushing from his mouth. And he actually grabs the kid and pushes him out of the way as the shark takes him under. Uh, which, I mean, that could be seriously creepy. Yeah. Um, Rated PG, ladies and gentlemen. Well, maybe that's why they didn't do it. Maybe. Because um, they did have to make some some cuts. But, the, the you know, everybody always says, gosh, Jaws is PG, you know. How'd they pull that off? This kid. Can we shout out this kid really quick? Like, give that kid an Oscar. He's so right. upset. Go ahead. <laughs> people shout out. Or people talk about. Um, I think his name's uh, Jay Mello. Jay Mello? Mm-hmm. It's a great name. And the other son is uh, Chris Rabello, um, who unfortunately passed on. Uh, yeah, he back. died. He died young. And we I just wonder what, what made that kid so upset, though. Like, what was happening to make that kid so upset? Because that's not acting. He was really upset. It's a good question. We'll have to look at the end credits to see if any children were harmed in the making of this movie. <laughs> Maybe he's just scared. Everybody's running away. People are screaming. He's a little kid. He's a little boy. We were talking about Roy's uh, intensity. Look yeah. at the the scene coming up. Look at just the the pure disgust he has with the mayor at this point. It's great. More of that acting without really saying much. Yeah, seventies man. It's the seventies. Here he goes. Yeah, Roy's about five foot nine. But I wouldn't want to see him coming at me like this. Mm hmm. Ooh, he's close. <laughs> close talking. Watch out. You got a bit, Larry. He's going to give him a tracheotomy. The mayor's just totally added to this point. Like that coat, though. I was about to shout out the coat. I was like, do I shout out the coat? It's pretty sweet. I mean, coat. this stuff's like in style now. This pastel. This movie was 40 years ahead of its time. But again, look at the, act the acting here. So good. Yeah. Murray Hamilton, great. Yeah, and you know, he plays a role too that you don't agree with him, but you understand where he's coming from. Yeah, the mayor. I mean, and he, he's he's actually kind of like a, a more likable character in Jaws too, or a yeah. little bit more sympathetic. He, he's a little more on Roy's side in Jaws too. And and may I say, for the record, I think Jaws two is an excellent sequel. I enjoy watching Jaws two. I do too. Like I, I like them all. Yeah, I really do. 
Look at him. He's mad. Mm-hmm. I've actually had a lobster roll where they are right here. This was all torn down, but there's like a really great lobster roll shack. And man, and you're sitting there and you feel like you are, you know, in Jaws. So it's not, themed for the movie. Not in Jaws, but in the movie Jaws. Yeah. Um, but this is like, this was just a prop. Like they had to tear this down, the zoning. They made them tear down the shack. But whatever they've got there now, it's like a great little restaurant. Hmm. Got to go up there, Heath. Uh, you're really, you should, we should submit this to the the tourism board up there. And just like, yeah, <laughs> recruiting. <laughs> Sounds great, man. I want to go. I really do. I love the movie. I love the location. Yeah, there's not enough. I don't think, I don't think there's enough movies that take place on the water or movies that take place around the water. I mean, they, they had a, a hot moment after this movie and obviously the jaw sequels and stuff, but especially nowadays, there's just not enough movies that have that seaside theme. Yeah. Which, which puzzles me why you would be slow to coming around to jaws just because you mentioned 20,000 legs under the sea and Mm -hmm. Like this movie and that, you can just kind of smell the salt water in the air when you watch them. They've got just like yes. this great thing. And, and also uh, John Huston's uh, Moby Dick. Uh, I believe that was out with Gregory Peck in 1956, I want to say. Um, but uh, I love, have you, uh, I'm not going to ask you if you've seen it, but it's great. <laughs> yeah. uh, some people might not like it, but it's just well, a great, great older movie. Yeah, well, and then he, I mean, I'm thinking of The Fog. They did The Deep after this, uh, but mm -hmm. then there was The Fog as well. That's another creepy seaside. Though it's a little bit different. It's still like the same kind of thing. It's like, um, you know, terror on a coastal town. And then as we get further into the 80s, I just feel like it gets further and further away, and you don't see as much of that stuff outside of Jaws. And like you said, it just seems strange because it's such a, yeah. yeah, I mean, but I was sorry. Just what you're seeing here is basically what was happening off set. Roy and M seeing these two. Uh, Robert Shaw bullied and picked on um, Richard Dreyfus, and Roy kind of refereed uh, the whole thing. Yeah, so they were just method. That's what so it was. the whole thing. Just yeah, a lot of it probably was method, like. <laughs> But uh, I'm sure it taps into their or their performances tap into what was really going on that tension and the uh, oh yeah competition I guess which is what a lot of, a lot of actors will do that they'll just give the others a hard time because it shows on screen whatever whatever Robert Shaw was getting at I mean he 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 brought a lot out of Richard Dreyfus and, and himself so I guess it worked this this oh I just love the the area here where this is filmed it's so beautiful and i mean i mean it's it basically still looks just like this i'm gonna turn the tables on you have you seen swashbuckler with robert shaw i have with james earl jones 1976 yes sir okay touche <laughs> he's really good in it though Here, so here's the thing so that was after this that was the and year seems, after this yeah he seems like he's 30 years younger man like in in swashbuckler he's so yeah like, spry and uh and then he would die not that long after that. But um, it just kind of keys you into when you see that. You're like, holy cow, this guy is uh, – he's really put on a performance in Jaws as like the limping, older, hobbled, salty, grizzled you know, captain guy. But then in Swashbuckler, he's literally running up and down stairs having sword fights. And it's not a stunt double. It's him. Shirt unbuttoned all the way down to his belly button, just like glistening bronze chest. He was like a leading <laughs> action man at 50 something years old. Uh, he did a great job with it. So, whatever he's doing here doesn't necessarily seem like he's acting, but he absolutely is. And uh, he's great. And I, I just hate that he's gone. I hate that we didn't get more from him. Robin absolutely. and Marion, also 1976, oh, yeah. opposite, opposite Connery, again, reuniting. The uh, bond with his with his foe. That has a great uh, John Barry score. Yeah, Robin and Marian. It's one of my favorite composers. 
Don't yeah. use the fireplace in the den because I haven't fixed it yet. Stuff like that. So that's got to be improvised. And yeah, tell them I'm going fishing. And that's what brings the the humanity to it. The the relatability that because they're not heroes. They're not. I mean, they are heroes, but they're not. You know, they're not Hollywood action heroes. They're just regular people. Um. 70s man this was all about the 70s we got a little bit of that in the 80s too you look at movies like poltergeist and some of that we we were still following real people but at some point it tipped into something else and then our blockbuster quote entertainment went into some other direction with these larger than life people i guess but this this line here that he's he's kind of you know pestering ellen brody with here lies the body of mary lee died at the age of 103 apparently robert shaw uh, remembered that from reading it off of a tombstone in ireland i mean where, where do you where do you get actors like that wow love that shot through the shark jaws yeah, it's so that's really iconic cool. and this shot here over roy's back he's going out to sea it's a cinematography again. Now, when you go, Heath, to Martha's Vineyard, you can uh, go. When exact, we go. When we when go. When we go, sure. Okay. Um, you can go right where this shot is being filmed and stand there and just, and you're there. <laughs> it's just nuts. Mm. <laughs> that sounds so cool. So, from here on, as far as I'm concerned, this is timeless. I mean, you can, you'll be able to watch this. Yeah. On your holiday. Hollow device in 20, 2093. Quint, the master of his domain here. I love how Scheider's got old, old spice he's putting on a. Mm hmm. I was wondering if that's what that was. I was like, that looks like a bottle of old spice. Yeah, that was the, that was the stuff. Oh, here's a great exchange between these two. Can't figure out Dreyfus. Come on. Look at this. This is great. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Oh, by the way, there's a shark in this movie. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. When when you lock into the characters, you don't you almost don't care what the what the the MacGuffin is. This is one of my favorite. Yeah, this this is one of my favorite lines here. Seen one eat a rocking chair one time. Could you imagine that seeing a shark eat a rocking chair? <laughs> no. I mean, wow. What, what what situation was he in when that happened? It's just part of what makes Quint so cool. I think you should do the rest of the commentary as Quint. You should just do the do the act. Or you could sing. You Not sing so some... good as a chief. I, I, I don't know. We're going to have trouble getting through the Indianapolis speech coming up. But... Yeah. But here, great tension. You don't even see anything. Just... Mm -hmm. And I love what the music, you know, the music hasn't really, you know, it's done its thing. But We haven't I, even talked about the music either. The music's going to take over this movie. But here, ever so subtly, building that tension. He knows. John Williams. John Williams. Is this his last movie? Is it going to be the, the next Star Wars or what? I heard he was retiring. I, I hope that's not the case. I think that's I think that's the truth. Is he wants to end it with the last Star Wars movie? But we'll see. I mean, I'm honestly amazed that he's still composing uh, and at his age, but he just loves it. He was born to do it. He's the soundtrack of our childhoods. Oh yeah. I can't think of any any other composer of the I was gonna say of the modern era, but forget that. I can't think of any other composer so closely associated with so many movies that identify basically entire generations. Like he what you think about the movies we the, the Jaws, Star Wars, Close Encounters, um 
all the way up through Harry Potter. Yeah, he was still doing it, you know, decades later. When people think about their childhoods and they think about some of their first memories, some of the movies that they loved, John Williams is the soundtrack to that. That's right. And this is really the movie that put him on the map. I mean, he was a well-respected uh, composer. Mm-hmm. He'd already won an Oscar for uh, arranging Fiddler on the Roof in 1971, but that's not with his original music. He was adapting the, the stage music for screen. And, um, you know, he'd done, like, some disaster movies. I think The Towering Inferno, for example. But The Lost in Space theme as well. Yeah, yeah. So he he was on track, much like Jerry Goldsmith, a lot of TV and then working in the movies. But, like, after Jaws, I mean... And and you got to give credit, you know, one thing about being a composer, just on the things that I've worked on, you know, um, just from a composer's perspective, you know, when a director lets you just do your thing mm-hmm. and lets you, you know, openly, you know, create and follow your instincts, um, you know, as you try to adapt it, you know, for their project, you know, that's really where you're going to get the best stuff. And um uh, I think Spielberg obviously trusted uh, what Williams had to offer and just let him put it all out there and do do his thing. Yeah, obviously George Lucas, very similar type situation with Star Wars. And I think once he established, you know, that he had the talent that he had, I mean, you get all these great soundtracks. Superman. I love the Superman. soundtrack to, to Superman. The movie yeah, is so me good. Too. I'm, I might even arguably say that's one of his best. Yeah. Um, but it's so hard to do that with, with John Williams. John Williams is his music has lyrics too that only he knows. Like that that's really cool too. I, I've heard. Do you know if there's any truth to the, uh, the to the story that um, when he presented the score for this, you know, the da-na-na, to the Steven Spielberg, Spielberg was like, okay, that's great, but really, seriously, what are you, what are you going to write? And he's like, no, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, apparently he thought it was just very simplistic and was, you know, maybe thought he was, you know, having a little fun. But, uh, I mean, the, the, that two-note exchange is so, it's just ingenious. It's so yeah. simple. It's, I mean, because you can alter how quickly... You know, it's 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 there. And and what what Williams has done throughout this movie is conditioned the audience really for when to expect the shark, um, which is why the scene coming up makes it such a good jolt, because you've been conditioned to kind of expect that theme. Um, like when the kids had the fake fin, you didn't hear the Jaws theme. Um, so, so if you fell for that, you know, whatever. But mm-hmm. But coming up with this uh, upcoming, with that classic scene with Roy chumming and the shark ar- arising, um, you're, you're, you didn't know that was coming because you didn't hear the music. And that that's a great to, point. That's on a, on a subconscious level. That's part of what makes that such a mm-hmm. good jump scare. And That's a great point. Uh, Hooper's going a little broad there, uh, Richard Dreyfus, but it just adds to the, he's just laughing this guy off. What a lot of people might might have to do to survive being on a boat with, with Quint. <laughs> the story of the boat is, as Spielberg tells it, do you want to, you tell the story. I'll let you tell the story. Like what happened to the boat at Universal Studios? Apparently, uh, it was unfortunately uh, used for, uh, it was chopped up. It, w- it was part of the Jaws display there, um, but apparently someone decided they needed uh, to chop it up for firewood or something like that. And Yeah, he would go visit it. Like when no yeah. one was around, he'd take a little little schooner around and visit the boat and just re- re- remember the experience. But Spielberg does have like the steering wheel, I think. He's got quite a few yes. parts to it, but... Yeah. Uh, but here, I think what we're about to see, um, while well, we have to say goodbye to the, the, the orca, <laughs> um, your, what happened on the orca, I think, right coming up here is probably the best 90 seconds on film. 
Oh, so That's great. That reaction. This is just everything yeah. here is perfect. Yeah. Let's just kind of watch this with everybody. <laughs> just have dead silence for 90 seconds. So here's, here's uh, Roy's ad lib line. You're going to need a bigger boat. One of the most famous lines in movie history. Yeah. Yeah. Just ad libbed. This is great. Quint comes out to see what he's what he's up against here. And just the music here. I love this this cue as the shark glides by the boat. So I don't know what that is. It's just magical. Mm -hmm. Thrilling and just this is like a boxing match with the two are seeing who's coming into the ring. Oh, that shot. It's a good looking model to or you know machine it's they they did a really good job on it and i don't need to see full-on shark glory i oh, i like the they're the, right there yes uh, somebody told me one time oh jaws is okay i don't like the graphics are you kidding me the, gra the graphics what Oh, it's just, you know, we're just so numbed by computers. It's. Yeah. But this, but uh, I love this movie because of the very fact that they're out in the actual ocean, you know, filming this thing. Yeah, that's to be, we, we should point that out. This movie did not film on a sound state, you know, like a back lot or a tank or anything like that. They're in the Atlantic Ocean. There are a couple spots where, you know, they, they were filmed, like I was saying earlier, in a pool or, you know, I can outline, you know, the cage scene. There's some stuff filmed on an MGM tank. But, yeah, this everything on the boat is, everything on the Orca is off the shore of uh, Martha's Vineyard. And the movie's picking up such energy here, you know. And sometimes those those moments that are slow or that are building... Mm -hmm. You get the payoff with 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 this. This is high adventure on on the sea. Yeah, you've earned it. it. It's highs and lows, the crescendos, and the music here is just building such great tension and excitement. It's it's really great. Do you have the audio going? Is it in your ear? Um, I like I can what I've got. No, this. I was wondering if you're listening to it while you're doing. Like, I mean, I can hear it in my head. I've, trust me, I've seen this so okay. many. You got the soundtrack. So We're trying to keep it, uh, you know, copyright free, right? Yeah, I was jealous if you could hear it. I was like, man, come on! Oh, I love this. This movie is also ruined by full frame cropping. <laughs> I want to point that out. This movie is beautifully shot in widescreen, and when you crop it, like those early VHSs and stuff like that, TV TV presentations really do no justice to how beautiful this movie is. I'm having to watch the DVD because my, my I couldn't get my Blu-ray to play, but the Blu-ray was uh, remastered mm -hmm. and just looks gorgeous. So if you haven't picked up Jaws because you've got it on that you know the DVD released in the early 2000s, just just you can get it on Amazon for less than ten bucks most days. Um, I looked earlier today. I think it was like six ninety nine. But this thing. this thing is uh, digitally remastered. It looks absolutely, you know, perfect. Um, I can't believe it's a movie that's forty four years old. Wow. Yeah, it does. It does not look forty years old. This, and the, the the music here is so great. It's like a pirate adventure or something my subtitles say adventurous instrumental music building yeah <laughs> so and then the music just falls into the disappointment as that barrel goes underwater mm -hmm. and the actors realize it ain't over yet straight into camera yeah Look at that. Look at that shot. Ugh. I don't know, man. It's kind of boring. They're just standing there. Look at the graphic. <laughs> CGI <laughs> on that boat looks a little it's wobbly. Weak. It's too wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ugh. 
you can see the uh i guess what is that um noxema on uh yeah Brody's nose because they were worried about Scheider coming off as a tough guy cop so he's kind of like he's almost kind of just too domesticated to be out in that kind of situation what they're trying to communicate there I guess yeah but the inner toughness comes through but ultimately you can't suppress there. it you can't stop it can't stop the Scheider <laughs> yeah here we are we're getting like all engrossed yeah i'm, I'm sorry I'm, i don't like, want to do that i don't want to bore everybody feel feel this not this is like the like can, weapon scene when they compare oh, i was i was gonna say you know you, you just can't recreate that mm. they tried people try Or a eel. Get right through my wetsuit. I don't know about that, Oop. There's an arm wrestling contest. <laughs> so... She's so rich with characterization. I mean, you know, I think there was a, uh, with the Indianapolis speech that's coming up, Apparently everyone took a crack at it. John Melius actually wrote a lot of it. Uh, a guy named Howard Sackler wrote a lot of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine Carl Gottlieb uh, did a lot. Carl Gottlieb being the screenwriter of the movie. And he's very accessible to Jaws fans, too. He's a really nice guy. Uh, he also worked on uh, The Jerk. When I, when, I, when I got to meet him, I had him, uh, you know, he was at Jaws Fest signing autographs and I had him sign my uh, my car got Lieb photo uh, as Iron Balls McGinty from The Jerk, <laughs> which he also wrote the screenplay for. Uh huh. Mary Ellen Moffat, she broke my heart. Apparently, Mary Ellen Moffat it was an actual uh, lady on the island. Apparently, that's what I've heard. Hmm. I love how uh, Scheider is there exchanging uh, scars he's got like an appendix scar that he looks at mm -hmm. an actual appendix scar another improv yeah the the improvisation in this movie is a huge part of it, it it's so many of the things that we love about this movie were just made up on the spot i always wondered what they were eating it doesn't look very appetizing hmm looks like some I can't tell. In the beans or something, I don't know. I think it's toast and Nutella. No. <laughs> You're on Minneapolis? What happened? Well, Nick Cage made a movie with Mario Van Peebles around 2015. <laughs> you remember the Indianapolis movie that came out a few years ago? I don't. I have no well, idea. What there's a, a Nicholas Cage. Nick Nicholas Cage made a movie about what he's what Robert Shaw is describing. Yeah, no, I just... Which is an actual a, event in history. Yeah, and it was covered up for a long time, too. Or not covered up, but it was kind of in the dark. The details. Apparently, yeah, I think it was disclosed just prior to this coming out. Or mm -hmm. being made, anyway. I'm looking up but, Indianapolis. Yeah, it's directed by Mario Van Peebles, who happens to be in Jaws 4. It's nuts. Um, Man, I haven't even heard of this movie. 2016, it's got 5.2 stars. Well, Nicholas Cage, more. Tom Sizemore. Yeah. Tom Jane. Have you seen it? I I purchased it. It's one of those that you buy and you just haven't gone around to watch it. <laughs> right. It looks, it looks very like CBS movie of the week. Yeah. Maybe that's one we can uh, watch together for the first time and we can comment on it. Okay. Yeah, but the, the whole thing behind this is that like, there was an Indianapolis ship during World War II. It was the... yeah, I'll let you tell it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just an actual World War II um, Japanese submarine sunk the Indianapolis battleship. The, the crew were left to, uh, to the, the ocean and the it sharks. Had a, and it had a crew of 1,196. 
And at the end of the day, when everybody, well, not the day, but when it was all said and done, 317 survived. But uh, but uh, but this uh, speech, like uh, apparently Roy came up with the uh, black eyes like a doll's eye. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently uh, Robert Shaw wrote a lot of this. John Milius, Howard Sackler. So a lot of guys worked on it. Spielberg probably as well. I believe the documentary says that Milius turned in 10 pages and that was the Shaw took the 10 pages from John Milius and got it down to five. Yeah. Put it put it in his own words. John, this is like totally in John Milius' wheelhouse. Yeah. Upended. Uh, You've been bending half below the waist. Everybody's just like, yeah. I think there was like a, a a survey of like when Jaws was most, uh, you know, thrilling or scary to the audience, and mm-hmm. uh, this scene actually was one of the higher, uh, you know, you know, audiences tended to be more frightened during you know this scene in particular than than you know someone getting gobbled up by a shark, and that just tells you again, you know, what a difference. A screenplay and a great actor, and less is more in a lot of cases. That's the truth. I mean, this movie is a testament to that. Yes, less is more. I mean, it has the spectacle, but it also has this: the quiet, the the reason that we should care about the spectacle. The, it was. You know, very special to me to get to do. I did two. Uh, I did a version of Spanish Ladies for the end titles on mm-hmm. uh, the shark is still working, and also uh, kind of like a melancholy show me the way to go home. And uh, you can hear that on the end credits of the shark is still working. But just getting to to do those those songs again. Look at that food. What in the world? <laughs> What is that? What is that? I mean, it looks like it soil looks... green. Yeah, <laughs> where that uh, Charlton Heston is going to show up. He's coming. Don't eat that. Well, you know, if people want to hear your versions of uh, Spanish ladies and um, uh, show me the way to go home, if they buy that six ninety nine Blu Ray, this documentary is on the Blu Ray. That's right. And I can't believe when <laughs> talk about surreal. I mean, this is just a movie that I used to, I, I swear when we, when we first got a, a VHS player, you know, it was the, I, I remember the first uh, two movies I rented was the 1931 Frankenstein and Jaws. Nice. And I watched those like over and over. And I remember we watched Jaws and then like I, I was rewinding Jaws and I wanted to watch parts of it. And I was scared to hit play because I was so defensive that, you know, the shark's going to be like there and jump out and scare me, which is like what I was talking about. The, the first few times you watch this, it's a scary movie, but it's now I, I watch it. It's like yeah. 20,000 leagues or something. Yeah. When, when we showed this to my daughter, she was younger. She was like seven. We waited until we thought she could handle it because we didn't want to freak her out. Especially, you know, we live close to the beach and stuff, so we didn't want to ruin ruin her childhood. But when we finally showed it to her, she loved it. And uh, spoilers, they killed Jaws at the end. And she said, like, she was like, I really like that movie, but I'm sad. And we're like, why are you sad? And she was like, well, because I didn't want Jaws to die. I really liked his character. That's what she said. Did you tell her that he'll be back for revenge? <laughs> yes. Yes, I did. But many, multiple times. You know, a lot of people, you'll see some shooting stars flying by up mm-hmm. here. And I myself thought they were drawn in. And I've heard that they were drawn in, but I've actually heard that they were actual shooting stars that they picked up while filming this. Uh, well, here's one right now. I mean, I mean there's it, no animation credit or anything at the end. I, 
I, I think it might be real. It's just so perfectly framed that it makes me question it, but that looks drawn. Yeah, but who knows? Who yeah. knows, man? They, I'm not they... saying anybody's right or wrong. No, there's there will never be a, a definitive answer to that. Well, that so, bird that just flew by right there, that was real. I thought it looked like some pretty weak CGI, but these graphics. <laughs> Sloppy graphics. <laughs> Is this on the Super Nintendo or what? Can I watch it on my PlayStation? <laughs> this is some serious PlayStation 2 graphics. So here comes the barrel. But you know, I think I think people of our generation your generation, my generation, we identify with stuff like this because it's practical. I don't know that younger people care. Maybe they'll weigh in in the comments for this, but um, because we grew up in the age where this movie shot on the water in a boat and, you know, just so much stuff was practical. It, it was pre, it predated CGI. It just had a tangibility to it. And I feel like a lot of modern movies, for, for all the spectacle that they have, they can be successful. Like, again, I'm thinking of Godzilla. Like, I had a good time at Godzilla, but it doesn't feel tangible. It doesn't feel immediate in the way that this movie feels immediate. I mean, but everything that you enjoy about modern filmmaking, and, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, there's a lot more that we can do these days. And modern audiences get... A lot more, uh, you know, probably for their buck as far as spectacle, I suppose. Um, but, you know, for, for to have these great things we have now, movies like this are what, you know, made it all possible. Mm -hmm. it, it presented the problems that people had where they had to find these, you know, solutions to where these films were more doable. I don't know. It just if if you ask me, I'd much rather see a film with uh, three mechanical sharks that mm -hmm. were utilized versus you know someone just sitting and drawing it in on a mouse or you know yeah. no disrespect to if anyone that does that type of work. I don't know exactly what's involved, and I'm sure it's a lot of work and it's a lot it's of a lot of pre precision and craft work. But let's build. You know, that being said. Let's build a 25 foot great white shark, put it on a mechanical arm, park it 30, you know, 300 feet off the ocean and film this boat around it and mm -hmm. put people think, in its mouth. And... I think the last movie to attempt something on this scale was Waterworld. Oh, yeah. I think, I think that broke the system and they were like, never again. <laughs> we're not doing this anymore. Yeah, I, I need to get that. Uh... I don't, I'm not even a big fan of that movie, but mm -hmm. I want to see the uh, behind the scenes that Blu-ray that just came out. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the movie. It. I did. I'm not a huge fan of the movie either. I always want to like it more than I do. I go into it every time I watch it. I'm like, maybe this will be the time where I really connect with it. And I never do. But the story behind that movie is so fascinating. And it's essentially the same thing here. They just take a bunch of stuff out into the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Plunk it down and film it, and they're just out there, man. It's like stranded in the ocean while you you're just making this movie, it, like miles from uh, from the shore. And so, yeah, it's it's impressive because of that, because you just don't see that anymore. But again, here here we here we're again getting that energy that we had mm -hmm. just a few minutes ago, and this is just also good. And there's some great shots. On that music. Yeah. So should we talk about the sequels? Sure. Yeah. Um, what do you What do you got to say about the sequel? I, I know there's a I I know there's know. three of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jaws two. I I I seriously think that's. That's a good, worthy sequel. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, you had Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back. You had Jaws and Jaws 2 and, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. All these movies were kind of bundled together and everyone just enjoyed them. There was no talk of Jaws 2 really not, not being that, you know. It kind of gets roped in with, you know, the, the 3 and 4, which obviously had their issues. Uh, but still, you know, I can pop one on. On a Saturday, uh, when I get up and pop Jaws three on in the summer, it's mm -hmm. kind of fun to watch. Every I mean, one the, of the, them. The, the 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 concept of having a uh, great white shark 
infiltrate a SeaWorld theme park. I mean, that sounds like a pretty fun movie to watch. You know, Absolutely. unfortunately, it's not quite as fun as it should be, but it's still, you know. It's it's goofy fun, and whereas this one is not goofy at all. No, that right. movie becomes total. Each one of the sequels kind of fits into the era that it was it, – like it typifies that era of filmmaking. You know what I mean? It's like you can kind of trace – the bloat of the blockbuster by the time you get to three and you get to four it's like okay well this is what we're doing we're in like back to the future era here and we're in you know you can just tell the trends that were going on in the market at that time um jaws four totally uh excessive at that point but you know when i was a little kid and i saw that in the theater you know i just thought it was a good time (laughs) I mean, but but you know what? The the theatrical version had a completely different ending, which you can probably see. You can see it now on the Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, when they put that ridiculous uh, reshot ending and then when they put it out on home video, I mean, that ruined any chance for that movie because they made it, you know, just a lot worse than it than it was anyway. But the, the original ending when the shark, you know, was rammed by the boat was a lot more fun to watch than what we ended up with mm-hmm. so anyway that's enough about the sequel if we, you we want to come talk back about and... this if we if you want to do the sequels we can do the sequels if anyone wants to hear that but... i think i think they do i'm going to vote for them i think they do i think <laughs> we need to talk about them but space I guess them out so we don't burn them out but that could be a lot of fun i also want to point out this movie is like seriously speeding towards its conclusion and it does it not is. feel like we like an hour and 45 minutes watching this movie good movies do not feel the the running time just flies by it moves despite what anyone says <laughs> i mean there's a lot of shots where they're just like standing there looking out in the water <laughs> i saw the mythbusters where you know if you shoot a, an air tank, it'll just blow the head of the shark open. It won't blow the entire body of the shark up. That's silly. You know, I mean, come on. I mean, Movie magic. Maybe that tank was more compressed. I don't know. I mean, if it blew its head off, it still would have killed it. I don't know. Maybe it's I'm, a conspiracy. Uh, like, I can nitpick, but man, I won't nitpick this movie. Yeah. It really comes down to how much you buy in. If you buy into the movie, you don't care about stuff like that. You're willing to go with the narrative because you're having a good time. We can forget that sometimes, you know? We can forget that we're just supposed to have a good time with some of this stuff. So with these uh, mechanical sharks, I mentioned there were three. There were three mechanical sharks, and then there was a sled that had the fins that was dragged through the ocean. You uh, kind of saw the fin more earlier in the uh, estuary attack. Um but uh, they had a shark for that went right to left, and they had one that went uh, left to right, and then they had a complete shark that was would operate on a gurney. Um, so, given whatever angle the shot was, the other side had all the the tubes and gears, you know, exposed to where they could get to them. So, depending on the sh- the shot, uh, they used whatever shark they needed. And um, apparently the sharks you didn't start working until, like the movie I think started filming in March of 74. I think it was uh, late August uh, before the sharks actually started functioning. And uh, the sharks were tested in a, in a tank in Universal City, but it wasn't in saltwater. Uh, and obviously when they got the, the sharks out with, what, with all that the, sh- the saltwater did, uh, the sharks just didn't work as well. So as we see, the barrels were kind of utilized uh, in the meantime while they worked on getting it resolved. So each shark cost, I believe, a quarter of a million dollars. And uh, I believe the shot with uh, Scheider chumming marks when those uh, the sharks started really you know, working f- at least uh, to where they could get what they got. You said a quarter of a million dollars? Uh-huh. 1974 money, too. That's a lot of money. Uh-huh. And, you know, the robot, sh- the, the sharks were, uh, you know, kept under secret. And it kind of added to the mystique of, you know, what these folks were up to. 
um, which also, you know, shortly after this, that worked to the advantage of uh, the the '70s King Kong remake, which I have a strange fascination with. I love that movie. I love it. When you realize that entire movie is about sex, it's like, whoa! It breaks oh, the whole thing wide open. Jessica play. Jessica Lange in that movie. Anyway. I actually wrote about it. If anybody wants to read about it, so I, I have written like 250 columns for fthismovie.net, and I wrote – I've written up several. I've wrote up Swashbuckler. I wrote up King Kong 1976, uh, Marathon Man 1970. I did a whole series on 1976, and I covered a lot of that stuff. If anybody wants to read just a little bit more about that. Mm. But go ahead. I'm going to not think about just going into that King Kong movie, and, and let's <laughs> admire this shot and the music here and how it just swells. We're just – Onward, mm-hmm. trying to get to shore. And again, the barrel's doing the job that the mechanical shark just couldn't always do. Well, and that's probably one of the things that makes this a little superior. Well, a little makes this superior to the sequels as well, is because there is they they had developed the sharks a little bit better for the sequels. You see a lot of them. Um, but again, it's the Hitchcockian thing of like you know, what you don't see. You see the barrels, you don't see the shark, and it's better for that. In my opinion, it's better for that. Don't put that much pressure on it. What's what's Quint trying to do here exactly? Is he just kind of losing it, or is he actually scared and he's trying to get to shore? That's a good question. I think he's actually scared. Yeah. Because he just said, I've never seen one do this before. I've seen one eat a rocking chair, but I haven't seen one do that. (laughs) (laughs) Is he scared and also maybe a little nutso? Or is it... uh... Or is he scared and he's just trying to mask it with acting like he's not so bravado? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's a it's a it's a nuanced performance when you can't tell. Now, while we kind of have a moment here, we're about to hear an explosion. It makes me think of the mixes on these on on this movie. So in 1976, uh, when the 1975 Oscars took place. Um, Jaws won an Academy Award for its sound design, sound mixing. And um, this was, you know, just before Dolby was brought in and the more extravagant 5.1 mixes, and you know, mm-hmm. um, which really hit with Star Wars. But uh, they won an Academy Award. It's a great sound mix. And... When Jaws was re-released uh, in the 2000s for home video, there's a uh, 5.1 mix, and I like elements of that. Like you know, I'm sure a, a a younger person that's more accustomed to you know a 5.1 or 7.1 mix. Uh, there's just a lot of great stuff in there, but I feel like it it loses a lot. So when I watch this movie, I tend to watch it, it with the uh, 2.0 mix because that's you know what what you heard back in the day i only watch movies in mono man so but but like i mean there's just a lot of uh sound effects and dialogue that kind of gets masked and even music that gets masked under uh you know some of the sound effects that, that are added to it so i would recommend if you like it you know watch watch it with 2.0 and watch it with the uh surround sound and get the best of both that's interesting but just something to think about. Hopefully they haven't tinkered with it too much that they've added anything. Or, you know, in the um, they just released the 4K version of the 1989 Batman, the Michael Keaton, Tim Burton Batman. And there's new sound effects for the 4K. And people are really mm. upset about it. It's like you, the original sound mix of a film is part of the movie. It's not something that you can just change well george lucas does that a lot too um you don't mess with the original mix you know at least no, I, I mean you can maybe somehow try to f- find a way to separate it and, and make it sound a little more modern but you know when you start replacing things and it gets a little a little complicated 
that we just talked over uh, Quint coming out and throwing the life jackets after earlier saying, I'll never put on a life jacket again. I always found that interesting. Mm-hmm. And he's all buttoned up like he's ready to go to war. I guess he is scared. And they are going to war. Roy Shardy with his 0% body fat. He's <laughs> just nothing but lean muscle mass. He actually, in late two th- or early 2000s, he came out with a book uh, about acting well. I guess it was using method acting to convince yourself to lose weight or not eat or something. It was interesting. So it sounded interesting. Hmm. But I guess that kind of makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm in character. I, I can't eat that cake. Yeah, I guess so. Well, I, the cigarettes probably helped helped a little bit with that too. I guess everybody, you, all these people in the seventies were on so many chemicals and stuff too. <laughs> you watch it now, you're like, oh man. Well, I guess you're happy. You know, Dreyfus is about to be served up to the shark. <laughs> I don't dislike him. I'm just I mean, look I, at I Quint, struggle with him. But look at Quint. He he's like looking at him like, dude, this is. He knows. Look at him. Yeah. Richard Dreyfus went into the water that day. When they uh, lower him down here, uh, this was shot on uh, in. Um, Obviously, here we're in the ocean, but then it's going to go to uh, MGM Studios, the Esther Williams tank, I believe it is. Um, it's the Ethel Merman tank. Ethel Merman? Is it? <laughs> no. Esther it's, was, Ethel Merman sure. was the, the lady who saying, is like, there's no. I was, I was making a joke. My yeah. bad. That makes me think of an airplane, too. <laughs> <laughs> the Esther Williams tank. Is it Esther Williams? Or you uh, you had, I think you had IMDb up earlier. So anyway, that was filmed in a tank. So we're in a tank here. And you might find this, uh, the close-ups, I can't recall that guy's name. I think it's Richard Sparks, but maybe I'm wrong. But the far shots is Dick Warlock, who actually went on to play Michael Myers in Halloween 2. I just always thought that was kind of interesting. That is interesting. So like right there, that's Dick Warlock. So that's Michael Myers versus Jaws. If you, if you will. That's incredible. Okay, Esther Jane Williams was an American competitive swimmer and actress. Uh, she set regional swimming, national and regional swimming records. So I'm going to say yes, you are correct. The Esther Williams tank. It's been a while. I think, yeah, it's Esther Williams tank. I'm, I've got a, it's been a while since we did the documentary, so it's been like seven years. So I haven't uh, haven't really looked back much on this Jaws. Jowls. Oh, this is such a good jolt. Mm. That's freaky, man. Some people say, why did they have to put the real shark stuff in here? But, you know, I mean, this was before Shark Week. And uh, before, you know, you really had access to see sharks like we do now. Like there was like a movie called Blue Water White Death, um, 1971, which is a really good, you know, shark, great white shark documentary. But you didn't really see sharks other than James Bond movies. And I was gonna say, what was the Bond movie that had all the underwater photography? And it was a Thunderball. Thunder Thunderball, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is all in the the tank. And you'd never know it, really. No, you wouldn't know. Uh, so, so in the book, Hooper just he gets swallowed up. So I guess back in the day, everyone was thinking, okay, this is it, because that book sold a lot of copies. Everybody had read that book. I used to go to the library, and it was after Jaws 2 was out, and they'd have Jaws and Jaws 2 sitting on the shelf, and I'd just always check them out and just stare at the covers. I just always thought those, like I was saying before earlier when we were getting started, that that Roger Castell artwork, which I was mm-hmm. so happy we got to cover in the uh, Shark is Still Working. Yeah. Um, it's iconic. And um, I should give a shout-out to the other guys I worked on that with, uh, Jake Gove. Uh, Michael Roddy, Eric Hollander, and James Gillette. Hello, guys. I'm still talking about Jaws. 
And people so, still are, they're, they're still listening too. But look at this. This is real shark footage here. And then we were talking about before. Do sharks get that crazy? Well, look at this. Yeah, that shark is ticked Good off. Good stuff. Now, is would you say this coming up is probably the most famous death scene on film? Hmm, it's one of them. Um, yeah, you make a strong case. Yeah, I'm thinking of maybe something in Hitchcock, the shower scene in Hitchcock. I guess. Yes, that's definitely way up. I there. love I the rumble right here, like, and I love how he's just looking. He's like, oh. What's he seeing? What? I'll tell and you this too. Holy cow, man! I just that is great. I don't care. CGI, whatever. That looks cool. So I watch a lot of horror movies. I'm not squeamish. This is horrifying. Oh, this it's is brutal. terrible. And they just milk it for every. Uh, and look at the fear. I mean. The... It's like an ad goes on for like an hour and a half. <laughs> it just keeps going and going. I think somebody did an edit of that on YouTube. It's, <laughs> it's so fun. Oh, look, at he's just kicking uh, his legs. Oh, he got him. This is PG. Yeah. Oh, We're man. not worried about vanity here. Oh, I love how he's stabbing him. It's like, come on. Mm -hmm. He's not going down without a fight. Oh, jeez. Oh. And then they show him drag him under. Look at that. Uh, oh. That's so gruesome. That rivals anything in a Friday the 13th movie <laughs> or a Nightmare on Elm Street. That is so gruesome. And that's actually Roy in there. That's actually at sea. They actually put him in there. Wow. Not today. Wouldn't do that now. Insurance wouldn't let you. Probably not. Good CGI I'm in there. <laughs> CGI Roy Shard <laughs> looks a little weak, man. Put Chris Pratt in there with him. <laughs> <laughs> and all right. I was, it just, you know, they, they suggest Chris, I just think it's funny. They suggest, suggest Chris Pratt for every role. In there. Like, well, you know, the Indiana Jones should be played by Chris Pratt. I know. And you just, you reminded me that nothing's changed because so Scheider and uh, Gene Hackman were in uh French connection together. And then you were talking about how like, well, they had thought about putting uh Gene Hackman in this. Like they were the, it was the same thing back then. It was like, we like this person. We want them. in. Uh, I don't know. Gene Hackman. He's pretty, he's pretty top, top flight. Well, that's not what I'm saying. He is. I'm just saying, like, just when you when you like somebody, I guess they people want to see them in everything. Is just, Gene Hackman as is, is Gene Hackman as great as uh, Chris Pratt? I'll leave that to. Uh, I'm not touching that one. I'll leave the audience to 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 vote on that. Look at these shots. So this is me. Like when I was a kid, I'm climbing on the furniture. I got yeah. a broomstick. I'm fighting sharks off with this plan, and to to eventually get to the point, just even you know, just to talk to this guy. I swear, my hero. Look at that shot. Yeah. Mm. Shark is like really hungry. It's it's personal, man. <laughs> You're married to Lorraine Gary. I must eat you. <laughs> <laughs> She's out of your league. Oh, this is so good. So good. So, like, look at that shot. Yeah. Here we go. I just can't imagine anyone other than Roy Scheider here. What about Al Pacino? Just oh, <laughs> you son of a... Hmm. Should have just been his head. And they should just put in Peter Gabriel's Gabriel's Red Rain right there. <laughs> so Shider, here he is. He's ecstatic. I think this shot was actually reused on that awful, like I was talking about Jaws the Revenge. Mm hmm. I think it was. Oh, uh, when they did that. It was just, I mean, they had a really cool effect shot. But, uh, you can't beat this. Of course, the dinosaur roar connects this with Duel, 1971, Dennis Weaver, Spielberg movie. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen that, you got to watch that. There's a box set out that has a lot of this. That was Sugarland Express, yeah, Duel. Shark. Yeah, air documentaries in that. 
Oh, is it? Uh, so yeah. Jaws is in that as well? Okay. Yeah. You know, I would have loved to have seen what just happened from Hooper's perspective. Could you imagine at the bottom of the ocean looking up, seeing the mm-hmm. shark coming and all that stuff going on? That'd be crazy. Great acting here where, where they, they're just... Yeah. Exhausted. Thought he was a goner. Quint, no. Hee 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 hee. <laughs> Got the subtitles going. <laughs> no. Probably don't want to go get some sushi. Yeah, they're they're rethinking that stuff they were eating a, couple, <laughs> a few scenes ago. Want to go to Captain D's? <laughs> well. On a bad joke, I guess we're going to start summing this up, but I hope it's been fun. I, I've, I've really had enjoyed it. Last. And, this has uh, been great. Well, while the credits are rolling, why don't you tell people about all your uh, where they can find you and where they can get more, more of your art and your work? Well, I've actually been right at this beach, too, and you can get there if you go to Martha's Vineyard. Um, so cool. <laughs> it's still this commentary like is brought to you by the Martha's Vineyard Tourism, yeah. Bureau. Tourism Association. Um, look, I don't want to like toot my horn too much here. Um, but please, please I would, do. it would make me happy if you, if you happen to like Jaws and you didn't know, I've got a soundtrack CD out, uh, which again is available at my website, Michael McCormack music.com. Um, I put a lot of work into it. I tried to give it, I tried to score the making of Jaws. So uh, that's what that score is. And I tried to, you know, utilize the sounds of the Jaws score, but give it something, you know, authentic. So that that's there. It's got some, you know, show me way to go home and Spanish ladies, all that good stuff. Um, so if you're a Jaws fan and if you'd welcome that into your collection, that, that'd make me very happy. And hopefully you'd enjoy it. Um, so um, I have a band. I have a music project called Hardware to Halo that I uh, do with a guy named uh, Russell Chamberlain. Modern rock kind of music. Totally different. And then I work as a, a composer for documentaries and films when I can. So if you could visit me uh, at uh, michaelmccormickmusic.com, hopefully uh, you know we can meet again and Hopefully, Heath, you'll have me back. I really enjoyed this. So. Absolutely. And I love the man. channel, and I like the the way you you handle these things, and the positivity, and although you don't, you know, despite your Richard Dreyfus comments. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, this was great, and uh, I hope it I hope it's fun to listen to. This is my first commentary like this. So. This is the hope, first one. First one. So oh, hopefully, we uh, can do more. Uh, and if not, this will be the one that I did. <laughs> well, we were we're gonna do more for sure. Um, awesome. I'm on your IMDb IMDb page. I'm trying to find. Would you just mention your other documentary stuff? The other, if people like the shark is still working. You've oh, also okay. Um, so I've done. Uh, I did. Uh, uh, Long live the king, which is about uh, King Kong. That's streaming now on Amazon Prime. So you can watch that documentary, and maybe you'll get a look at Jessica Lange and the 76 King Kong. Um, I have a soundtrack CD for that, very King Kong, if you want to hear some King Kong kind of music. Um, I did a documentary called uh, Hail to the King for a kaiju cast, Kalyan a kaiju cast. So that's about Godzilla that played at uh, G-Fest. Um, I did a documentary called Monster Kids about the Universal Monsters. We're seeking dis- distribution on that documentary. That's with uh, Michael Roddy, a great uh, collaborator of mine. Uh, what else? Uh, I did a Back to the Future thing. Um, but anyway, you know, I've, I've done some stuff. But at the top of my list of things that I've done that I'll be happy that I did, it's this commentary for Serial at Midnight. Oh, wow. Okay. And Heath Hall. All right. All right. Well... So- this was a blast. A thank you, time. thank you so much for joining me for this. Thank you for being a part of this. This would not have been 
anything without you here to talk about this stuff. Uh, this was everything I had hoped for and more. So I want to thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We will absolutely listen. I want to talk about Jaws 2 uh, and 3 and 4. Well, guys, uh, let us know what you think about it. Let's uh, weigh in in the comments below. Tell us what your thoughts are about Jaws. The, are the are the graphics a little dodgy after after all these years? What do you think? Um, and if know. you ever oh, also if you ever get a chance to see it in 35 millimeter at a local screening, just go. It looks amazing on 35 millimeter. Oh, I bet. I'll end it on that. Wow, there it is, guys. Thank you. Until next time, we'll catch you later. So never more shall we see you Never more shall we see you again And so never more shall we see you again And so never more shall we see you again